alpha from 0 0.1 to 0 0.4. Uh, the actual forecast was more following the latest demand, in this case 250. Uh, when uh, when making making a forecast and and uh, the latest demand were given a much higher weight than the previous one, so we had some well quite a large deviation on the forecast on uh, uh, on on period number three here by looking at the two different values for the smoothing constant, but then they came back to the the same value because of the new demand here, which was much lower than the the forecast, and I have uh, created a an Excel sheet with this example, <coughs> where we also first we have we looked at the, the same sheet for the moving averages. Uh, we saw this one the uh, last lecture, and we we saw the forecast with the same numbers here, um, and see uh, see that the the forecast were looking at the averages, and uh, since it was increasing for period. Five, uh, yeah, from four, five, and six, he had an increasing trend. That this trend was actually found here, and the forecast tried to follow that one. By looking at the exponential smoothing, we <coughs> have seen the demand here. We have seen uh, this uh, forecast where we used the alpha value of 0 0.1. We came back to 2,202, uh, which we also saw by calculating on, on the blackboard. Uh, and we had now um, extended this uh, list of, of data points. And the uh, forecast will look like this. And here we have uh, uh, well coded the, the formulas for, for this uh, forecast in these uh, cells in Excel. So I will upload. Like we, can, like we can see here. I will upload this Excel sheet on, uh, on Frontage just after the lecture, so you can, have, you can study it. And we can also see the MAD, mean absolute deviation, and the mean squared error are shown here to compare the forecast with the actual demand, just li like we saw on the moving averages method on the same uh, data set. Uh, and now, in this Excel sheet, we can easily change this alpha value because the formulas here, they are referring to this point, cell number C15, which is the absolute reference here, and multiply by B5, which is the uh, previous demand, and add 1 minus C15, the smoothing constant, multiplied by D5, which is the previous forecast. So here we look at the formula coded in Excel, and by changing the value of uh, alpha, 0 0.4 for example, we can see that the yellow line here, which is the forecast, will change the, the, <coughs> the shape here. because. With a higher value on the alpha, you will more follow the previous demand. And we can see at the extreme situation, 1, alpha equal to 1. Then the next period will get exactly the same value as the previous period for the forecast. So we will only look at the previous uh, period's uh, demand to uh, make the new forecast. Similar, alpha equal to 0 you will have a straight line. The demand doesn't really matter, you have the same forecast anyway. And you can try any other... Yeah, 1.2 was... 0 0.2. You always have to be between, one, uh, between 0 and 1, otherwise this uh, will not, of course, give any um, well, good forecast. So here, using 0 0.2, you will have some line which is uh, well, it is uh, influenced by the previous demand, but you will not have too much variation because of here you can also see that this um, data set doesn't really uh, uh, well. You don't expect to have uh, any much trend, and you can see that it is varying a lot. And suddenly, with after a high 
demand, you will suddenly get a low demand in the next period. So I will uh, show one more example on these two methods, on uh, moving averages and exponential smoothing. Uh, and this is uh, an example uh, or a problem described in a textbook, page 73, problem 2.24. And here we have observed a weekly sales of a ballpen hammer at the Tone hardware store over an eight week period. And you have the, time, the series of numbers 14, 9, 30, 22, 34, 12, 19, and 23. First, suppose that you have a three week moving averages used to forecast these sales and determine the one step ahead forecast four weeks from four and up to eight. So let's try to solve this problem. First with the moving averages and then we'll look at the same problem with the exponential smoothing. start with uh, listing up the demand for the three first week because we need three uh, weeks of, of uh, or we need three data points to be able to start this uh, method. So one, two and three we have a demand of 14, 9 and 30. And then let's try to make a forecast. Period number four. Then uh, we should have the forecast, of course. We need a new column. And now we use the moving averages with uh, n value of 3. Use the three latest uh, data points. And we find out that the average on these three, uh, uh, the average of these three numbers should be 17.67. Then we get a new uh, data point for period number 4. It's given to be 22. And we can easily see the uh, forecast error, which is 22 minus 17.67. And if we want to uh, calculate the mean uh, absolute deviation, we just use the, the absolute values here. So let's see that the forecast error 4.33 in this case. Then, to make a new forecast, find the average of the three latest numbers, then we include 22 and skip 14. So now 9 plus 30 plus 22 will give us the next forecast. And this means in period 5, using the moving averages method, we will have 20.33. The average of the three latest number. And we get to period number five, and we see that in this period we had actually a demand of 34. Quite a high demand for this period. Forecast error will now be difference between this and this number, 13.67. And continue. Period number six, make a forecast. 30 plus 22 plus 34 divided by 3 should give us a forecast of 28.67. The actual demand turns out to be only 12, which gives a quite high difference. 12 minus 28.67 and take the absolute value, then we have 16. 
and we can continue. In period number seven, we have a forecast, which is the average of the three latest numbers, 22, 34, and 12. The average will be 22.67. The actual demand turns out to be 19. And the forecast error will now be 3.67. And last period, number eight, average 34, 12, and 19, the average will be 21.67, the, the demand turns out to be 23, and the absolute deviation, the forecast error, will be 1.33, like this. And then we can find easily the MAD mean absolute deviation will be the sum of all these five numbers or the, or the average of course which turns out to be 7.93 and also the mean squared error if you use that measure of, uh, of uh, forecast error will just square each of these numbers 4.33 to the power of 2 13.67 to the power of 2 and so on and make a sum of all these numbers. Which means that, of course, this period with a large forecast error will have a much, relatively much higher uh, effect on the, uh, on the MSE value because this value to the power of 2 will be so much higher than these small values to the power of 2. Okay, this is the way to solve this problem when you are using the MA the moving averages method with an n value of 3. Let's now try to solve this one by exponential smoothing and we are also given a smoothing constant value in uh, problem B which is alpha is 0 0.15. So now we want to find the exponential smoothing forecast for weeks 4 and up to 8. And to start, we just start with the same values in week number four as we found, uh, found by uh, using the moving averages method. So, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the arrow should it always be in absolute? Well, uh, when you are using this uh, uh, this uh, mean uh, or mean absolute deviation. It should be the absolute value which is important. But if not, then it's not the absolute. Now, otherwise, there could be reasons to see if it's negative or, or positive. Yeah, because so the book is negative also. Yeah, okay, then I was a bit inaccurate there. But <laughs> putting up the absolute uh, values here, then, then it will be correct. Because it was just to see what will be the value be for, for the mean absolute deviation here. Okay, let's now try to solve this with the exponential smoothing method and we have the same demand we start in week number four and now we try to find exponential smoothing with 0 0.15 as the value of the smoothing constant and we remember the formula for the exponential smoothing to get the forecast for period T, we should, uh, well we have different ways of, uh, of uh, describing this formula, but we can now look at F of T minus 1, which is the previous forecast value, multiply, no, uh, not multiply of course, but subtract alpha multi uh, multiplied by the previous forecast error, the F of t minus 1 uh, and minus the d of t minus 1. <coughs> Forecast minus the actual demand in the previous period multiplied by this alpha, the smoothing constant. And we start with the same values. So we need this value, 17.67. We need to have a start value at, point, at one point. And then 
to start this exponential smoothing from period number four, <coughs> we can as well use the result from the moving averages method. And this, of course, will give the same absolute value of the forecast error, 4.33. So, next value, uh, or the next forecast, will be, we start with the demand, 17.67, uh, and we want to find the previous, uh, or we have the, the previous demand, which is uh, now, forecast for period T well, T let's uh, say that we want to make the forecast for period number five and then we we'll look at the forecast for the previous period 17.67 minus 0 0.15 and multiplied by the previous forecast error and here, of course, it will matter whether it is positive or, or negative. Um, so the forecast minus the actual uh, demand, the actual demand turned out to be 22, and we had 17.67. So then we need to make sure that we use uh, the correct uh, way of uh, subtracting the demand from the forecast. So here we will actually get minus 4.33, which is the difference between the forecast 1767 minus the actual demand of 22. So the new forecast will then be higher since we have a negative sign there and a negative sign there. And then the forecast for period 5 will now be 18.32. So, we can again, and oh, it's uh, correct as you said, it, we should actually have the, uh, the signs in the table here, because then it will be much, much easier to, to use the numbers directly. So here, we can just remove the absolute values and say this is a negative one. Here, we also have a negative since we are subtracting the actual demand from the forecasted demand. 18.32 minus 34 will be minus 13.67, like this. Make a new forecast, now F6 will be 18.32, this value, and minus 0 0.15 and multiplied by the last forecast error minus 1367 which again will give us a higher number which is 20.67 and yeah of course this is wrong I shouldn't use I need to find the correct value here, not, not use the, the uh, deviation from the, uh, from the um, moving averages. So, of course, we have a forecast of 18.32 and we have an actual demand of 34, which will give us a forecast error of 15.68. That should be the correct number, minus 15.68. Like this, now it should be correct. And this will now give us a value of the forecast for period 6 to be 20.67. Uh, and again, we continue, make a new forecast for period, uh, yeah, we can find the, uh, the deviation, which now should be 8.67, or minus, no, now it should be a positive value because we have a forecast of 20.67 and we have an actual demand of 12. So this should be 8.67. And we continue, find a new forecast for period 7, 
we have 20.67 now as the last forecast and we have 8.67 as the last forecast error multiplied by 0 0.15 this will give us a value of 1937 which is very close to the actual demand so here the forecast was quite accurate forecast error now will be 19.37 minus 19 0 0.37 and last period number eight which is 1937 as the previous forecast minus alpha which is 0 0.15 and multiplied by the previous forecast error which was 0 0.37 will give us a value of 19.32 which should be compared to 23 and give us a negative uh, forecast error, which is now minus 3.68. And if we sum all these together or sum the absolute values together, we get an MAD value of 6.55. together and find the, the average value of the absolute deviations here. So in this case the MAD value says that the exponential smoothing method gives us a better result than the moving averages method. And this will also be the situation if we are comparing the squared errors. But that doesn't mean that uh, exponential smoothing is better than moving averages in general, it means that it was better for this particular example. But there is no uh, rule, we cannot say that one method is better than the other because in different situations they can give different results and of, of course also of different quality. So, I think that was the answer for question C based on MAD, which method did better and of course I have just found out that an MAD of 655 is better than 7.93. And we can also try to answer the last question. What is the exponential smoothing forecast made at the end of week 6 for the sales in week 12? So, can anyone answer that question? End of week 6. Well, um, this is a stationary series, uh, a method for stationary series, and we, have, we are given a forecast which is expected to be valid for all periods in the future. This method doesn't really, uh, uh, it doesn't uh, consider trends, seasons, and any other, uh, uh, some kind of, uh, uh, well, uh, dependency in the data points. So. At the end of period 6, we were given a, a forecast of 19.37 for period 7. And this is also actually the forecast. If we are at this point, we don't have any more data points. This will be the forecast for any other period in the future. We don't know what the demand will be in the next period. We don't know how this method would, will develop either with an increased or decreased forecast in the coming periods. So here we need to consider this result as the forecast for all the coming periods until we get some new data into this, uh, uh, this method. So we have seen now two examples on methods to use when you have a uh, stationary series. And we can go back to a figure which was shown earlier, this one. And we are still in this example here. Stationary series, purely random and no recognizable pattern. We don't know. We can try to identify a pattern for some of the uh, <laughs> data points here for some period, but then suddenly in the next period, the pattern will, well, you will get results which uh, uh, ruins the theory of any 
trends or any other. So here we have no recognizable pattern, means that we have a stationary theory and we will try to make a forecast which should be valid until we get some new data point and update this model. But now, the next model we will look at is those which tries to identify a linear trend like this. Either an increasing trend, as in this, uh, um, uh, this example here, or this graph here, or eventually a decreasing trend. That can also happen, that you have a decreased interest of the, uh, the product you are selling. And then, these two method methods we have seen, the exponential smoothing or moving averages, are not able to identify this trend. It can find it after a while when new data point, points will, uh, uh, will adjust the forecast, but still the forecast will be the same because we don't know if the trend will continue uh, during, by using these two, uh, two methods we have seen so far. So, let's now try to look at some more advanced method which can also identify a trend so-called trend-based methods. And the first one we will look at is the method called regression analysis. Where you will try to find the formula of a line which identifies the trend. Also, in, in these types of, uh, of models, these types of, of data, we will have, uh, I will present two models. The first one, regression analysis. Trend based method, we have regression analysis. And we have what we call a double exponential smoothing method. Still, it is related to the exponential smoothing method we have just seen. But now we have what we call a double exponential smoothing, uh, which also, in addition to try to identify the actual value of the forecast, will try to identify the gradient of the line how much it will increase or decrease from one time period to another. And this is called double exponential uh, smoothing. But first we will look at regression analysis, and as you remember, regression analysis is also uh, the topic of the first assignment, one of the, the problems in, in your first assignment. And when we have this situation, we have a trend, it is not Uh, well, you will still have some variation, but you will have a variation around a line which is increasing or decreasing, a trend. So the variation will not be from a straight line, as we saw in the stationary series method, but it will be from a line which has a linear trend. And what we want to, know, uh, to find out now is the formula for this trend line, because then we can use this line for forecasting into the future. And we know from mathematics that the formula for a straight line, y should be equal to a constant a plus the gradient b multiplied by x. This is the x-axis and this is the y-axis. And if we know the values of a and b, it's very easy to calculate the corresponding value of y when we have the x value. Go into this line, set a value of, uh, uh, of x, and then we can easily find the corresponding value of y. 
and the demand line here, the trend line, can be showed the similar way, but we can now use the demand for period number t, which should be equal to the constant a plus the gradient or slope b multiplied by t as the time period. So now this will be the timeline and this will be the demand line. Looking at one particular time period here, we can find the expected demand for, for that period by looking at the trend line. So this is now what we want to identify. And we also know that the point here where the trend line meets the y-axis or the demand axis will be the same as the constant A. Because when t is equal to zero, then the demand should be exactly the value of the, uh, where the, the trend line meets the demand axis. And the B value will uh, be the gradient, which shows how much does the trend line increase or decrease from one period to the next period. So this is one period, this is the next, and then the B value will show how much will the difference be on the trend line from one period to the next period. And here we can, well, as usual in, uh, in these forecasting uh, problems, we will use historical data, analyze historical data, try to find out how is the demand uh, uh, increasing or, or decreasing, how is the development of the demand. And if this is today, then we are here. And to make a forecast for the next period, instead of looking at the forecast or, or looking at the previous, uh, uh, the, the latest demand and the latest forecast as we have seen in the stationary series method, because then we would have one exact number which should be the forecast for all coming time periods. But now we can see next period, we expect that the trend will continue with the same gradient and we can continue here and make a forecast which is up here. Not the same as we found in the previous period. If we now want to forecast several periods ahead, we can just continue the trend line here and say that the forecast will be up here. Of course, if we expect that the trend will increase it at the same, uh, same level. Uh, and I will now show the formulas because what we need to identify is the values of A and B to be able to uh, construct this, uh, this trend line. And then I will show the formulas to find these values and uh, which describes the line that best gives, uh, best fits to the given uh, historical data. And the proof of these equations they are, uh, is given in Appendix 2b in page 120 in the textbook. And as mentioned, I will not go into details of the mathematical proofs except about the induction. But uh, you should try to study it and hopefully also understand the mathematics behind this uh, proof. Uh, it uses formulas which we have actually proven by induction in the last lecture because it will use the, the formulas for the sum of xi for the n numbers, which is uh, shown to be n, n plus 1 divided by 2. And we also saw one example of the sum of the square of the first n numbers, which was proven by induction to be n, n plus 1, 
2n plus 1 divided by 6. Uh, we have proven by induction that these formulas are correct to uh, describe the sum of the n first numbers and the sum of the square of the n first number in a time series 1, 2, 3 and so on. And these formulas are used by uh, in the proof for, uh, for proving these um, uh, formulas for using in, in regression analysis. Uh, so. I can just present them. As mentioned, I will not go into the details of this mathematical proof, but you should try to study it yourself to, to get a more insight on, on these methods. But, as mentioned, we now want to find the value of A, the point where the trend line meets the demand axis, and also the B, which is the uh, gradient or the slope of, of the line. And we can see that the B value is defined as, two, uh, as, uh, as the quotient of two other variables, which I will uh, present in, in a short while. They are called the SXX or the SXY first, divided by the SXX. Uh, and I will come back to the definition of these two variables. but we can easily see that when we know the gradient, we, if we assume that we know the B value, it is pretty easy to find the A value. Because the A value, where the trend line meets the axis, uh, the demand axis or the Y axis, can be shown to be the average value of the demand, which means if this is the time period we are using for historical data, the midpoint of the line will be the same as the average of the demand. And the midpoint of the line will be approximately here. This number is the average value of the demand, the midpoint of the trend line for the full period we are using in uh, we are taking the historical data from. And when we know this value, we can just follow the line because we also know about the B value, or we'll, we'll find it in a, in a short while, and we can follow that line until we meet the D axis. So here, D, the average of the demand in the full uh, scope of the, of the time period we are using, minus B, and multiplied by uh, n plus 1 divided by 2. Then we start at this point, the average d, and follow the line back to 0. If you have 12 data points, then n plus 1, 12 plus 1 is 13 divided by 2, 6.5 multiplied by the slope, which means that we are here at value 6.5 and go back to 0 with the same gradient. So this formula can be used to find the A value when we know the B value. And to find the B value, we need to calculate the SXY and the SXX. And I can show the formulas for them. Where SXY will be equal to N, the number of data points, multiplied by the sum up to N. 4i multiplied by di. This means the number of the time period multiplied by the demand for that particular time period. If we start counting by period 1, then i is 1, and di is the demand for period 1. 
for period 2, i is 2, multiplied by the demand for period 2. And this number should, then we should subtract n, n plus 1 divided by 2, and multiplied by the sum of the demands for all the periods up to period number n. This is the formula for calculating Sxy, the nominator in the formula for finding the value of b. And Sxx, the denominator, can be shown as n to the power of 2, n plus 1, 2n plus 1, divided by 6, which we probably recognize as the formula for the uh, sum of the square of the first n numbers in a time series, multiplied by n once more. Minus n to the power of 2, n plus 1 to the power of 2, divided by 4, which is actually the square of the formula for the sum of the n first point. So this is now the formulas for Sxy and Sxx to be found by, uh, for identifying b, and when, when we know b, we can easily find a, which is the intersection of the trend line and the, the demand axis. So, I will show one example on this also, but I will now go to, let's see, number 17, which is more or less the same as I have, uh, have shown on, on the blackboard here. Reg regression can be used when you have a trend, and then we need to identify this formula for the trend line. We have the formulas for Sxx and Sxy define B to be <coughs> Sxy divided by Sxx and define A to be the, uh, <coughs> the intersection point of the trend line and the demand axis. And these values provides the best fit of the data in a least square sense. So we have data points and we are minimizing, this is the, what we call the least square method, to minimize the squared distance between the data points and the trend line shown by this uh, formula here. Okay, then I think we should take a break and in 15 minutes I will continue with one particular example on how to use regression analysis to identify a trend line. Thank you.